<clears throat> okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to complete the um, trio, which is to introduce uh, Professor Miles Stanford from St. Thomas's, who's going to discuss um, uh, the medication of options. One would assume that's uh, based on our knowledge of the immunology and everything, but uh, um, that's why we're here to work out how we can go forward. So thank you very much, Miles. That's all right. Thank you very much, Andrew. Welcome back, everybody, from uh, the last Birdshot Day. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Miles Stanford. I'm an ophthalmologist and chief poisoner at St. Thomas's Hospital. Uh, and it's very much this stress on that what we treat you with are actually poisons, and there's a very delicate balance between you, the patient, getting side effects and preserving your vision. Now, there's all sorts of drugs for Birdshot chorioretinopathy, and as a general maxim in medicine, if you see this many drugs for a single condition, you can be pretty sure that none of them is ideal. And of course, we know that. Um, what are the options? Well, we could do nothing. We are faced here with a chronic disease that's going to go on for years and years. We've got drugs that we know cause very nasty side effects. Why do we treat you at all? Um, and we also know that this disease comes in various varieties. So some people have very mild form of disease, whereas some people from the word go have a very severe sight-threatening form of disease. And there is certainly an option to do nothing in those who have the mild form, but just keep a really close eye on how the various visual parameters are doing. We could use drops, and we do use drops, but generally speaking, birdshot affects the tissues at the back of the eye, and drops in general will only affect tissues at the front of the eye because they don't penetrate very far. So we might use drops if people have a little bit of extra inflammation at the front of the eye, or if they develop complications of the inflammation in the eye, such as raised intraocular pressure. So I'm not really going to talk very much more about that. Now, the third way that we can give you treatment is by giving you periocular injections. So these are injections that are given around the eye, but not into the eye. And generally speaking, the injections that we use are a formula of steroids that are long-acting. So they're given as a sort of depot, which gradually seeps out and works on the inflammation at the back of the eye over about three months. Now, these periocular injections are probably best used for people who have inflammation in one eye alone. And of course, as you all know, birdshot chorioretinopathy is a condition that affects both eyes at the same time. Periocular injections don't always work, even when you're dealing with just one eye. So what I've shown on this slide is a number of different treatment series that have been reported in the literature. I don't need you to look at the figures, but the takeaway message is that increase in visual acuity as a result of an injection like this only occurs in about one in two patients, okay? And improvement of the inflammation in the eye, again, only occurs in about half the patients. So, yes, you can go down this route, and it does work, and if you do get the injection and it does work, it'll last for about three or four months, but then the inflammation starts to creep back again. And, of course, in the long term this is really not a practical solution for people with this sort of disease. Okay, so we now move on to intraocular injections, which are becoming more and more fashionable in ophthalmology, including in the treatment of birdshot chorioretinopathy. Now, I think this is a very rational and logical choice for what is a localized inflammatory disease. Why on earth do you want to give all these horrible drugs that give you nasty side effects when actually the seat of the inflammation and the thing that's making your sight go is actually localized to the eye, at least as far as we know? For many years now, we have been giving injections of a form of steroids called triamcinolone into the jelly at the back of the eye, and it is extremely effective. So any of you who have had macular edema, for instance, almost 95% of the time, giving an injection like this will get rid of the macular edema, okay, with, hopefully, return of vision, but that doesn't always occur. Um, but again, the problem here is that this injection will only last three to four months, and you've got a disease that goes on for years and years. 
Now, fortunately, the clever drug companies are now introducing uh, steroid inserts, many of which you will have heard about. So now, recently on the market, there are some inserts that release steroids for about six to nine months, and perhaps the commonest of this is known as Oziodex. Um, and then for, uh, the, the, something that's been around actually for a lot longer, maybe four to six years, are a much longer-term insert. So this is a polymer that, again, slowly releases steroids over a period of three years. Now, this, unfortunately, has to be sewn into the back of the eye, and it has a number of complications. But just think, this is three years without having to take systemic immunosuppressions that give you all those side effects. Okay, so the problem with all these steroid inserts is that we have the problem of cataract formation, that's the lens of the eye going cloudy, and also raised intraocular pressure, which if it continues for a long time, will give rise to the condition known as glaucoma. And indeed, in the trials of the long-term inserts, over 90% of patients who receive the insert required to have their cataracts removed, and a high proportion needed uh, surgery to prevent glaucoma progression. So it's a balance. There are some other intravitreal uh, drugs which are being tried. So a number of you will have heard of a drug called Avastin, which is commonly used for macular degeneration. This has been tried in patients with intraocular inflammation, although the results, in my mind, are a bit mixed at the moment. Others have given uh, a drug called methotrexate. And there is a new drug coming on the market, which unfortunately is just under trial at the moment, called Cyrolimus, which looks as if it may control intraocular inflammation without giving rise to cataract or raised intraocular pressure. But that's really for the future. Okay, so what about the commonly used drugs? Steroids, glucocorticoids, you all know about because you've all received them. There are a number of other drugs which I'll just briefly touch on. So, uh, but before I do that, let's just talk about the general principles. So first of all, we have no randomized controlled trials to tell us what to use, and that is unfortunate. You need to know what you're going to treat. We're faced here with a chronic disease, uh, which goes on for years and years. What parameter are you going to use? Are you go just going to use the visual acuity? Should you, as Nigel mentioned, look at patients who are losing their color vision? Should you look at the constriction of the peripheral visual field and use that as a parameter? So you need to decide right at the start what you're going to use to measure the effect of your treatment. The next principle is getting control of the disease. We see a number of patients referred to us in the tertiary uh, referral centers who have been undertreated elsewhere. And the key message here is really get on top of the inflammation despite any side effects that may happen and then deal with and then slowly reduce the treatment thereafter. So reduce the drugs in a stepwise manner until you either have cure, that is you can come off the drug and you haven't got the inflammation anymore, or you go to relapse. And depending on where you are and how much steroid you're taking when you relapse will determine what other drugs might be used. Obviously, you've got to monitor side effects closely and remember the patient. We are completely aware that steroids can ruin people's lives. They make you get fat, they alter your mood, they upset your sleep, etc., etc. But we do have to balance that about the potential benefit to your vision. So, briefly, steroids can improve vision when used on their own and depending on the dose in about 60% of patients over a year. You can get improvement or stabilization of vision in about three quarters if you add an additional immunosuppressive drug, but you must expect steroid side effects, and these occur in at least 90% of patients. Another drug that's used is a drug called azathioprine, and we tend to introduce azathioprine when disease relapses, that is, the vision gets worse, etc., when it's still on quite a high dose of steroids, or you develop hazardous or medical side effects from your steroid treatment. Now, azathioprine is not really a very good immunosuppressant, so we wouldn't normally give it as a first-line treatment, but it's jolly good at reducing relapses. It takes quite a long time to get into the system, so four to six weeks for, for full thing. 
And it can be kept on in com combination with steroids for a long, long time, so long as you, the patient, actually respond. And of course, it takes four weeks to wash in, but it also takes four weeks to wash out. And when you're on azathioprine, you need regular blood tests to monitor your liver function and your white cell count. Cyclosporin has been around for years. It's a good immunosuppressant. It's probably as good as steroids, depending on the dose that you give. You need to watch kidney function and blood pressure while you're on it. And it can be used in combination with both steroids and azathioprine. And some patients, possibly some of you here in the audience, may be on this particular combination of treatment. Uh, mycophenolate mofetil or Cellcept, again, is another good immunosuppressant, which I know is used extensively in patients with birdshot. It is synergistic, that is, it has a different action on the immune system to other drugs like steroids and cyclosporin. You need to be monitored closely when you're started on it and throughout your treatment with it, and it does give you adverse effects. And these are mainly related to your guts and can be expected in about 25% of patients. So about a quarter of patients on Cellcept, that will need to be discontinued because of side effects. So, just to give you a sort of brief overview of how we approach uh, the treatment of patients with birdshot, this is what I call the bridge approach. And in fact, I've just come back from Sydney, so this is quite appropriate, but this is Sydney Harbour Bridge. So, at the south side, which is on your left, that's the beginning of the disease. That's when you really want to get in control, and you may do that with drops, with injections, with steroids, or with cyclosporin. And then as you go over the bridge and your disease progresses, then you start to think about other disease-modifying drugs, such as Cellcept, such as azathioprine, or possibly even methotrexate, which you'll need to have and kept on in the longer term to try and prevent the long-term effects or side effects of steroids themselves. So just a last note about the future. I think there is little doubt that the development of slow-release intravitreal drugs is going to be the way forward over the next five to ten years, or possibly even longer. It makes such good logical sense that here we have a localized inflammatory condition, why not treat it with localized anti-inflammatory drugs? The other drugs that I haven't mentioned at the moment are the so-called biologicals. These are drugs that target the cytokines that Graham was talking about, these messenger chemicals within the immune system, which have been highly effective in diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, etc., and are being used regularly in patients with all sorts of uveitis, amongst which patients with birdshot will be treated as well. But the problem here, again, like most most uveitis conditions is that we don't have the clinical evidence of the efficacy of these particular drugs, nor what they might do to you when they're given over a period of many years. Thank you very much.